Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, today, I have Lauren Carver with me. She is a pelvic floor physical therapist out of Atlanta, and we are going to dive into whatever we decide we want to dive into today. So welcome, Lauren. <laughs> That's right. It's going to be a little bit of a, uh, a mosh posh. It's going to be good. Thanks for having me on, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah, of course. So why don't you give the listeners a little intro to you and what made you go into the area of pelvic floor PT? Yeah, so my name is Lauren Carver. I'm a pelvic floor specialist. I live in like North Metro Atlanta. I recently started my own company about three months ago, actually. So I'm treating patients. Um, my company's name is Barbell Pelvic Rehab. And I started into physical therapy because I broke my arm in gymnastics and I really felt like I loved the whole process. I thought it was amazing getting people back to doing with what they love to do. And so that was my primary driver to going into physical therapy. Um, I was primarily in the orthopedic uh, outpatient world and for about seven years and then decided to focus my efforts more into like pelvic health and um, just the pelvic floor field, mostly because I felt like it was a very underserved area. And I love working with women and I love working with active women. And this is a big problem incontinence and pelvic pain and painful intercourse is a big problem in that population. So it was a good fit. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think is the majority of like, what is the biggest condition that you see in your practice? Well, I, I get a lot of referrals from, um, urology. So I do see a lot of interstitial cystitis, um, with lots of pelvic pain. And then I also have a little bit of a niche that I work with active women who are trying to get back to exercise or feel safe with exercise during pregnancy and postpartum. So I do see quite a bit of people who are group fitness athletes or, um, CrossFit or like to lift weights. So I get a good mix. Okay, cool. So you used to do gymnastics. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> do you still do anything like that? Uh, no, I, the last time I've done like a backflip was like four years ago. And I told my <laughs> husband, I'm like, I'm going to do this every year and just see how long I've got it. But it's been four years. So uh, oh my God. I don't trust myself to try it anymore. That's so funny. My mom has a friend who her email address was like cartwheel 65. And the reason behind it was she wanted to do a cartwheel every single year until she turned 65. And so every year on her birthday, she'd do a cartwheel. Oh, that's and cute. It's, it's just really funny that that kind of is similar to what you're doing. Yeah. It helps keep your mobility. Yeah. I tried to do like a back bend the other day. I'm like, I need to work on my spine and my abdominal. <laughs> Oh yeah. Region, Cause it was tight. Oh, I've always been so jealous of people who are flexible because I was a three sport athlete, but I had zero flexibility. Like I still, I, I really try, especially being in PT yeah. and the, you know, they're like, okay, do happy baby, do a figure four stretch, do all this. And it's like, I'm struggling to even reach those spots. Oh yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. And then there's, struggle. <laughs> there's the doctors that are like, Oh, just do yoga. And it's like, you don't just do yoga. Right. That is hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard. Oh my God. You. Okay. So when it comes to interstitial cystitis, what is your typical regimen with those patients? Yeah, well, I know you know this, but we have to really hit it from a very holistic approach. So, I mean, there are so many things I look at. I look at sleep. I look at stress. I look at fluid intake. I look at bowel movements. I look at um, their daily activity. Are they doing a lot of sitting? Like what's their, their typical life situation? Look at their spine mobility, their pelvic floor mobility, abdominal wall mobility, their breathing mechanics and like toileting mechanics. So um, we usually don't get through all that in the first day, but that's kind of getting a full picture of why this has kind of um, impacted their life, I think is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
I know that there's a lot of people out there that are intimidated by pelvic floor PT. And I always tell them, you know, if you're worried about the internal exam or anything like that on your first few visits, like you're allowed to say no to that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, there's a big educational piece when it comes to pelvic health. So some of it is like even half education. And so there's a lot of things that we can do. And the internal exam is always, you know, patient dependent patient has to feel like it's something that they want and that they consent to it. Um, there is a lot of things that we can do that are external. Ultimately, the internal stuff, I think, helps people move along quicker, just they get more benefit. But that's always just patient dependent. And sometimes we save it for the second visit or the third visit, just whatever the patient feels comfortable with. Yeah. Do you have any tips for making people feel more comfortable with that? I think part of the reason why people feel uncomfortable is that they don't really have like a good expectation of like, I'm going to pelvic PT. Like I have no idea, like, what am I going to be doing? Like, what does an exam look like? And essentially explaining, having the therapist explain the exam, like very in detail before the exam, um, and during the exam. And then just, um, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest, the, the biggest piece is like having an expectation about what it's going to be like and what exactly they're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I've heard physical therapists before say, like, if you want to call the office beforehand and, and just have a quick chat with the therapist, like a lot of them, I think are willing to do that. Like, is that something that is typical? Yeah. I mean, they can absolutely call the office. I really like sending my patients before their initial exam. I'll send them an email that has like a little video and then just say kind of like what to expect. Oh, that's like, not to expect when you're expecting, but what yeah. do you expect at a pelvic PT's <laughs> office for the, for the initial treatment? So I think that that has kind of broken down a little bit. The barriers are like, okay, I can like visualize and kind of understand what's going on, prepare myself for, for it. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that more physical therapists should do that if they're not already. I mean, that's awesome. Um, so you, you talked, uh, you talked with me about how you focus on the abdominal wall. Can you talk more about that and its relationship with IC? Yeah. So um, the bladder, um, a lot of pelvic floor physical therapists are uh, just, we focus a lot on both the pelvic floor and the abdominal wall. The bladder sits in the front of the pelvic floor, kind of right by the pubic bone area. And that's kind of why you'll get that super pubic pain or that pubic pain right above the pubic bone. And so if there's tension in the abdominal wall, the abdominal wall is the front of that canister. The pelvic floor is the bottom. So if you have any overactivity in the muscles of the pelvic floor, they will kind of compress up and give the bladder less room. And then the abdominal wall will actually push from the front. So it's getting kind of compressed from all directions. So that's like a nice, a nice thing to focus on because there's a lot of people, every single one of my IC patients has abdominal wall tightness, and it's usually a big player into their pain. Once we get their abdominal wall to cool down and calm down, they usually get a lot of relief. Now that you say that, I'm like, I think I have issues with my abdominal wall. <laughs> yeah. I have so many patients that will, that will send me messages after the first visit. Like, oh, I do clench my stomach all day long. Like, yeah. yeah. And a lot of people who work at computers will clench their stomach or suck their stomach in and they yes. don't, they don't realize it. Oh my God. Yes. Growing up, like I was so self-conscious about like my, my stomach slash like pooch. I don't even know why I call it that the pooch area. And mm -hmm. so I would, I would try to suck it in a lot. And I think there's a lot of women who do this. Um, and I think that did a lot of damage. Yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so it's it's kind of like undoing that. And so how can how can you help people? Like, how do you help people with that tightness? So a lot of it is manual. Part of it is manual therapy techniques. So doing some abdominal, like myofascial work, cupping over the abdom, um, abdominals. Um, we also do some visceral techniques. Visceral just means moving organs. And so there are some external visceral techniques that we can do to just kind of offload the bladder and kind of like move it around. I give patients like a home exercise, like they can kind of scoop their bladder up like a little ice cream cone and kind of get it to mobilize a little bit better. Um, and another thing is that if there's that nervous system driver, if people are constantly in that fight or flight response or they're guarding, um, that can really cause a lot of tension in the abdominal wall and likely one of the big things that we work on in pelvic PT is breathing to help downregulate the nervous system, which I'm sure all your IC warriors know. Oh that. yeah. Um, working on, you know, some lower belly breathing or some pelvic breathing, which also really just helps mobilize the abdominal wall as well. So when you're actually breathing nice and low, that's helping that abdominal wall move in and out throughout the day. If you're a chest breather, you're clenching, you are gripping. And then that abdominal wall actually never gets a chance to kind of relax or kind of move away from the bladder. So if the bladder is already irritated with any type of inflammation, it's just going to keep it compressed and irritated from the front. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. So I want to back up because I don't think any of the physical therapists that I've had on the show before talked about just defining the word myofascial and, and talking more about that. Do you think you could kind of take me through that? Yeah. So myofascial is a word that we use that describes the muscle tissue and then the fascia that encapsulates it. So if you think about a chicken breast that you get from the grocery store, it has that capsule or that capsulation over it. And then the muscle tissue or the meat underneath. So there are the fascia actually connects multiple parts and multiple muscles and multiple what are called slings in our body. So it's constantly a um, kind of almost like a little bit of a tug of war battle, depending on what movements we're using. The fascia will actually tighten up. What happens to the fascia if there's not a lot of mobility in the muscle over long periods of time is the fascia itself can get tight. So the muscle may be working well, but the kind of the capsulation over it isn't sliding and gliding over the tissue. So there's, there's some adhesions or maybe even like little scar tissue that can be present there. So the, the, the myofascial work that we do is trying to get that tissue to slide and glide and move really nicely and um, also help some of those trigger points in the muscle where the muscle's not contracting and relaxing normally to get those to also move well. Okay. So what does that work look like? Like, how do you, how do you do that? So it, it looks a lot like massage. Okay. <laughs> so um, like you can do some like there's so many different techniques. You can use tools, um, cupping or any of the, um, any of like the metal tools. Um, oh yeah. Those hands. look really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know they look scary. Like this looks like, <laughs> like a weapon. It's not, yeah. I promise. Um, skin rolling. So there are a lot of different ways to get that tissue to release. So it, it looks, it looks different, but the, the main goal is to get some movement and just to get that tissue to release a little bit. Okay. So we have skin rolling, which I've seen physical therapists do on like Instagram reels before. Yeah. So it's, it's not very pleasant. It's, it's very yeah. effective but it's not pleasant. Okay. It's probably the most uncomfortable of all. Oh, <laughs> and, and where do you do that? Um, anywhere there needs to be tissue to move. Um, I do not do it on the pelvic floor. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's too sensitive, but abdominal wall, the, the hips, the glutes, the legs, the back, you can do it 
all is that something people can do on themselves yes so that's one of the self-care techniques I teach them okay skin rolling and then um I love cupping because cupping is pretty easy to do okay talk about that Yeah. So I love cupping just as a self-care technique, um, just to keep things loose. So there's two types of cups they have. um, They make silicone cups and they also make um, either the plastic or the glass cups that you kind of suck the air out of. Um, I usually have people use the silicone cups because they're, they're just a little easier to do by yourself. And what you do is you kind of squeeze the air out of it and then you place it on your skin and it pulls that skin up a little bit. And then you um, add a head, a little bit of lotion to the skin and you can actually like slide and glide the cup along like the abdominal wall, the hips um, and all around. It's, it's a great, um, just a great maintenance technique. Okay, cool. So where, where do people get these cups? Well, you can get them off of Amazon. Amazon. (laughs) Oh my God. I love it. I just, uh, I just made a Amazon storefront. So maybe I can put some cups in there. (laughs) If people can see what we're talking about. Oh my God. That's funny. So how is this something that people can do if they don't see a physical therapist or is this something that people should go see a public floor PT? and then discuss with them and then do like, is it harmful if somebody were to just listen to this episode and then buy cups and then do it? Um, I don't, I don't think so. It's hard to hurt yourself with a silicone cup. Just know that it should be like light pressure. You're going to get the best results if you actually see a pelvic PT, because they're going to be able to show you where and kind of how long and what your, um, what you should just be checking for with your skin. You don't want it it's, this isn't like a situation where you leave and you're like, have a bunch of purple spots on you. It's a lot more of a gentle technique. So I guess in a, as for a safe answer in a perfect world, you, you probably want to see somebody to help you with that, but yeah, no, we're not holding you liable for anything here. Oh my God. When I think of cupping, I think of Michael Phelps at the Olympics. I know everyone's (laughs) like, you're going to do what? (laughs) Yeah. Right. You're going to leave with like all these random bruises on your back. (laughs) Yes. But, and uh, like my favorite place to cup is like right over the bladder because all the other, all the other techniques that we have are compression techniques. So if you think about, you're always pushing down massage is a compression technique. Um, pretty much everything's a compression stretching, like Um, foam rolling, all those are usually compression techniques, but the cups actually create a decompression force. So you can stick them right over your bladder and kind of just gently pull up and move it around a little bit. And that's like a really nice kind of thing. I want to do it. Yeah. (laughs) You're intrigued. Yeah. That's going to send you some cups and then we'll meet up again. And yeah, (laughs) no, I might, I might, I'm going to talk to my physical therapist about this. Um, I feel like there's probably like YouTube videos explaining how to do it, right? I don't know. I haven't looked. <laughs> there's everything on YouTube. Maybe I'll look, yeah. Maybe I'll make a reel. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Follow my Instagram. Yes. I'll have a bladder cupping reel. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. We will post the link in the show notes so people can uh, follow you. We're going to get you to 10,000 followers. Yes. Single-handedly, yeah. this podcast is yeah. going to get you there. <laughs> Um, yeah so for everyone listening we were just looking at Lauren's profile and she is like 300 followers away from 10,000 so we're we're gonna get her there yes (laughs) appreciate that oh that's great so what other like self-care techniques can people use at home or what do you recommend your clients do at home besides the the cupping or the skin rolling Yeah, there's another one more abdominal. I love working with the abdominal wall because it just like is, is, I think, a game changer, especially if you kind of plateaued with some of your results and you've mostly been working on the pelvic floor. I think abdominal wall game changer. Um, There's also like a ball rolling technique that I really like people to get a kind of like a squishy ball. I have a specific one that I love, but kind of any soft ball will work. And you just kind of place it on your abdomen um, and then you lean against the wall and you kind of roll the ball against your abdominal wall. So that's really nice because you can get all the way from like the bottom of the rib cage down to like the pubic area. And that helps keep things like nice and loose. 
And then anything that just down regulates the nervous system or increases people's rest and digest nervous mm-hmm. system. So breathing, meditation, um, any type of yoga poses, um, self, any type of self care is really awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just from a maintenance standpoint, a lot of those pelvic floor stretches, um, some of those self-care tools like intimate roses, wands or dilators, all those yeah. things can be really helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I used to use a tennis ball and like would lay on that and that was uncomfortable. Let me yeah, tell you. Yeah, that's aggressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're saying a squishy ball would have been better. A squishy ball. Yeah. And then like, if people really tolerate it, I'll have them lay with a squishy ball on the ground and they'll kind of like roll on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Tennis ball is like, is very aggressive. Yeah. I'm, oh my God. Now I'm thinking of like the lacrosse balls. Like, yes. Yeah. That would be so anything. <laughs> Anything that makes you tense up <laughs> in not order good. to like, yeah, not great. Cause not we're trying great. to like get woo, everything to calm down. Yeah. So that's why I tell people with the stretches too. I'm like, don't get yourself in a position where you feel like you're like squeezing the daylights to preventing the stretch from happening. Cause like, that's not doing anything for you. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. If you're straining, it's like going to make it worse. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So And I feel like, I feel like a muscle that we've never talked about on this show before is the psoas. So psoas, did I say that right? Yeah. Does does that come into play with the pelvic floor? It does. It's, it's a muscle that originates in the lower back, the spine, and then, um, has to actually make its way through the pelvis in order to get to the front of the hip. Um, and oftentimes that's a place that I will dry needle for people who have any dry needling. Okay. Here's our next hot topic. (laughs) So dry needling is actually illegal in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Like what what is that about? (laughs) So I, I can't say that I know exactly why in Pennsylvania. Um, however, I know California, they have good, um, the acupuncturists have good lobbyists. So I think they're protecting their profession oh. by trying to block physical therapists from using needles. Okay. Well, that's messed up. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, I think it's more of a political thing, um, wow. than anything. Uh, but yeah, in the state of Georgia, we're able to needle. We just need a doctor's script. And there's some States that actually don't even need a doctor's script to be able to needle. So it's awesome. It's really effective. Um, there's a lot of different places to needle for pelvic pain or IC, the hips, the glutes, the, um, the inner thighs, the psoas. Honestly, needling is the easiest way um, to release the psoas because there's that kind of bottom part of the muscle that inserts right into the groin area. And when you um, when you get a good spot, the whole muscle, you can actually feel like a very deep contraction and relaxation of the muscle. Oh, I want that. Oh, I wonder if I could travel to a state where it's legal. You can, yeah. <laughs> because oh. Kelly, I got you. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Maybe I'll come yeah. down to Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also dry needling of the pelvic floor muscles. Whoa. So um, this, like all the superficial and deep muscles can also be needled. Um, wow. So that's, that's a whole, that's a whole different situation, but different it's, ball it's, game. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's helpful. You know, when people are in a lot of pain, they're just like, please, like whatever will give me relief. So, right. Right. So is it the same thing as acupuncture or is it different? So when I'm explaining to a patient about the difference, acupuncture usually doesn't go as deep as a dry needling does. Um, dry needling goes deeper into the muscle, into the trigger point of the muscle where the muscle is not contracting and relaxing normally. And the needle kind of penetrates that spot. And it, and if there's a good spot and good contact, we can get a localized twitch response where the muscle will like contract and then relax. So 
it's deep, it's deeper. It's a deeper technique. It's a usually a more aggressive technique, but it can be, can be gentle. It just depends on the patient and what their, their tolerance level is. Okay. So does it hurt? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very small needle. Mm-hmm. So sometimes usually when it hits the spot that it, it needs to, it will feel like a very dull ache sensation, almost like someone was touching a sore muscle. Um, so people don't normally get a really big pinchy pain when the needle goes in. It's more when it actually hits the spot, it kind of recreates, it recreates their symptoms. Mm-hmm. And okay. then it can be sore for a little bit, 24 to 48 hours afterwards. It can feel like just a little sore. Okay. So in, in this scenario, pain might be a good thing. Exactly. Yeah. I actually, I like reproducing people's pain when I'm dry needling. That means that the pain um, I'm likely getting rid of the pain or at least releasing the area that is generating their pain. Um, so it'll give us a little bit of a head start on getting their, their body to relax and be able, be able to kind of move into that next phase. Okay. And how often do you dry needle on people? Like what's, what's the protocol for that? Um, it depends. Usually when I see somebody for IC, I'll see them once or twice a week, or if they're in more of a maintenance phase, you know, sometimes once a month, or they'll come and see me when they have a flare. So, I mean, I will needle them twice a week if they, if their tolerance is there and they like it. And sometimes I won't needle the same locations twice a week. And sometimes I will, if we feel like they, they feel like they need it. So I love how you said I'll needle them once a week. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. That's so funny. Um, and, and not all pelvic floor physical therapists are like, is this a certification that you have to get? Yeah, it's a, well, I know in the state of Georgia, it's like a separate, um, you have to take a certain amount of um, continuing education credits, mm-hmm. and then you, um, you get your dry needle certification through the licensing department. So yes, it's a separate certification. Um, I know for a fact in the state of Georgia, I can't, I can't attest to every other state, um, but you have to be practicing for a certain amount of time before you can obtain it essentially. Okay. I'm currently Googling the States that (laughs) it's illegal. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and oh my God, dry needling the fight between acupuncturists and physical therapists. Yes, exactly. (gasps) Oh my God. It's a whole situation. (laughs) Jeez. This is crazy. Yeah. Wow. So it looks like Hawaii um, Washington, I think I saw like a, one of the Dakotas in there. I had the list up and then it just disappeared. All right, whatever. So we just know that there's a couple States, including yeah. California and Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can't, Hopefully do, not that many more. <laughs> you can't get needled there. Of course it's the state I'm in. I know. Of course. I know. <laughs> I would love to try it. I think that's so cool that there's so many different techniques and there there's a lot of people with IC who have tried acupuncture before. And I think the results are, are variable and, you know, I've tried it and it, it didn't really help me. And, and the thing was the, the lady who was doing it, she would like put the needle in and she would be like, did you just feel a release? or whatever. And I'd be like, no. And then she'd like move it. And she'd be like, do you feel it now? And I'd be like, no. And then there was a point where I would just say yes. Cause I was tired of her asking. Yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah she was looking for affirmation. Yeah. yeah so th- with the, the dry needling techniques is that we put it directly in the muscle that we think is causing your discomfort or that is holding tension where acupuncture may put it in, you know, your hands, your face, your ears and all that to just help with overall pain. And there's a lot of research that shows that that can be helpful. Um, but with IC, there's a, there's such a huge muscular driver, pelvic floor driver, abdominal wall driver, um, around the bladder. So if we can get those muscles to release, 
you know, sometimes that will really help with even, you know, their frequency and urgency and pain and all the above. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pelvic floor PT is just so important for IC. And I think that was really validated by the updates to the AUA guidelines for treatment. And like, I'm sure that felt good for you, right? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Because I remember the old guidelines, there was that hierarchy of treatments, like the the first line, the second line, the third line, PT was like second line, Mm -hmm. I think. So that that's really great that they're putting an emphasis on that because I, I really do believe that it's so helpful because the majority of us have pelvic floor dysfunction, right? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's hard to say if it's like a chicken or an egg situation. Right. You know, I have some people who say, oh, my flare started because of stress. Well, we know that stress impacts the sympathetic nervous system or your flight or flight response. And that the pelvic floor is very triggered by stress. It contracts as a protective mechanism. So, and then does that irritate the bladder or was it more of the other thing that irritated now the pelvic floor is guarding. (laughs) It's like, it's like this whole cyclical situation. That's yeah, really no holistic approach. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think it just goes to show how important down regulating the nervous system is like I've talked about this before I feel like I've gone through all 26 years of my life in fight or flight yeah <laughs> and it's really sad but mm-hmm. I mean I think my body just got so used to being like that and then my pelvic floor just was always tense and guarding and mm-hmm. you know what with having that pain it's like it's it's just protecting it right Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you, do you have specific things that you do that are the most helpful for you to kind of keep your symptoms at bay? I love it. I love the question. Um, let's think, what do I do? So I, I guess you could say I'm in like the, the maintenance phase of PT. So I'm, I'm doing that like once a month. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been doing Evelyn Hecht, who was on this episode, her pelvic sense program to try to rewire my brain. Um, I exercise, which helps me. It doesn't help everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the important thing is finding a method that works for you. And for me, like meditating or guided breathings have never really been helpful, or at least that's how I perceive them. I I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm sure that they were sort of helping, um, but it really just would frustrate me. (laughs) So So did the opposite. (laughs) Yeah. So I would like avoid doing that. And it, I, I, you know, I, I think that everyone needs to find one or two methods that works best for them. So I guess if you want to do like a guided breathing, or if you want to do a, like a body scan or if journaling works for you, writing your feelings out, that can, that can help a lot Mm -hmm. for some people. Um, just sitting outside or petting your dog, like things like that, I think are underrated. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I have a a lot of like my super type A personalities. It's not always the case, but they're like, yeah, I can't meditate. Like good luck doing that. I'm like, okay, well what we're going to do instead right? (laughs) is you're just going to find something you love, you love and preferably outside and you're, you know, you're going to do that instead. So there Mm -hmm. are definitely a lot of different options and it's not one size fits all. And yeah, what you, what you do figure out on this, this journey and this journey of helping others is that you have to have a lot of tools in your toolbox because what works really well for somebody may not work very well for somebody else. So preach. That is so accurate. Like, I, I feel like I say that like 10 different times a day. I bet you do. (laughs) Like it truly is a puzzle. And everyone needs to find their unique puzzle pieces and how they fit together and having those tools in your toolbox to have to prevent 
and also like treat flares, I think is, is so important because like you said, not everything works for this, for everyone. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a crazy condition that we're living with that there isn't like one thing that works for everyone. And that's, you know, that can apply to diet. For example, it's like, there isn't one diet that works for everyone. Like the the IC diet, for example, like, yes, it's really helpful for guiding an elimination diet, but you know, it, it, it may not work for everyone. A lot of people don't even have diet triggers. Um, there's practitioners out there that are like, everyone needs, needs to follow a low oxalate diet or a low histamine diet, or everyone needs to go gluten-free. And it's like, does blanket statements just drive me crazy because we are all so different and we just need our own individualized treatment plan. Definitely. And also taking away entire food groups or entire food lists is like not, it's not good for your nervous system either. You're like, oh, stressed. Now I can't eat anything at dinner. Now I can't, like, now I can't enjoy this with my friends. Like now I'm on this restricted diet. And a lot of those triggers may not even be triggered or those, a lot of those like Mm -hmm. things in the list aren't even triggers. So that's a really good point. That is, oh my God. I always tell people like we live in a very food centered society. You can't like go hang out with friends and not have food come up at least one time or, you know, meet, meet for drinks or meet for coffee or, you know, it's just everywhere, especially in the summer. It's like, there are barbecues, there are graduation parties. There's literally every event you could ever imagine. Like the 4th of July, the typical food would be like hamburgers, hot dogs, like, I don't know, macaroni salad, whatever the heck people (laughs) eat. But it's like, none of that is IC friendly per se, but people just over restrict themselves and they, they put these rules on themselves that they don't necessarily need. Mm -hmm. And that can cause a lot of, I always say FOMO, fear of missing out, Yeah, Um, which (laughs) as you said, it creates stress and it really plays a role on your mental health because if you're feeling left out, there's that part of it. But as humans, if we are told we can't have something, it makes us want that thing that much more. And then- (laughs) (laughs) If you end up indulging in that item, you might, I mean, if you are sensitive to it, you can cause a flare and then, you know, have that guilt about it, or you could cause yourself a stress reaction. Right. And and just the stress of like worrying, oh, was that a flare? Like I shouldn't have ate that. Like that can cause a flare in itself. And you may not even be sensitive to that food. Right. Right. So everybody needs... (laughs) Everybody needs to, to get with Callie and get this figured out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it highlights the importance of having a team yes. and have, you know, you have your physical therapist, you have your dietitian, you have mm-hmm. your IC specialist. Um, do you have maybe like a regular therapist, like a psychotherapist? Mm-hmm. Am I missing anything? Mm. I don't think, wait, uh, those are the, those are the main ones. Those are the, yeah, I think those are the really, the really big ones, but absolutely. I think that because a diet can be such a huge player in this, that is um, usually when like people get to me, they've already restricted themselves so much Mm -hmm. um, to the point we're having a conversation about, you know, and that's not my wheelhouse. I can just say general, general, um, things, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, having, having a resource like you, I think it would be really awesome. So yeah, absolutely um, for that. Um, yeah. And, and even like bowel movements, um, 
and constipation and that plays a huge role it's kind of like how the abdominal wall can compress the bladder from the front the pelvic floor can compress it from the bottom and what's on top of it and what's behind it the bowels mm -hmm. so having regular bowel movements also is important if someone's really restricting what they're eating they may now not have normal bowel movements right because they're so not having enough fiber if you make any drastic changes to your diet like it's gonna impact your bowel movements like yeah. one way or the other yeah yeah and nobody yeah. wants that especially constipation that is like the worst thing mm -hmm. for your bladder like it i is. can speak from experience, um, mm -hmm. I have IBS and whenever that flares up, it's like, okay, now I not only have an IBS flare, but I also have a bladder flare and then I'm, right. I'm just knocked out for the entire day. Yeah. So if you've never worked on your abdominal wall, that would be amazing. Probably. For yeah. you. Is oh, I, I can't tell you how many patients who I see who have IBS and IC or IBS and endometriosis and IC. It's like, they're all so connected. Um, and right. they, they play such a role and they interact with each other. So, right. And if people aren't drinking enough water, that also plays oh plays gosh. A part in all of this, That's huge. like, yeah. yeah. I, and I think there's people who restrict their water intake so that they don't have to pee a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course that makes sense, but it's like it, your body needs a certain amount of water. And if you're not getting that, you're, you're going to know, like you're going to have constipation, you're going to feel tired. Yeah. Um, you know, your, your skin might start looking a little funky. So there, yeah. there are signs that you're not getting enough water. And I usually recommend, you know, aim for 64 ounces a day. You know, there's other people who say like divide your body weight in half and that's how many ounces you need. Like I just say shoot for 64 and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think in the, the general recommendation is half your body weight in ounces. But if I have somebody who's severely restricting and they're only at like 20 ounces, because this, yeah. this is something I see often, um, I will have them increase it slowly because their body is now used to being in a dehydrated state and their kidneys are just going to process that and they're just going to be peeing all the time. And so yeah. that's going to give them more of a frustration if they already have a frequency problem. But another like really important thing um, that I educate my patients are is that I like to use the Kool-Aid example. So if you think about powdered Kool-Aid. I've never heard this had, before. <laughs> yeah. If you had a shot glass of water and power and you poured like a tablespoon of powdered Kool-Aid and then you had like an eight ounce glass of water and you poured a tablespoon of, of Kool-Aid, the concentration of this is going to be significantly more like acidic, significantly stronger. It's going to be like your dark red. What? Yeah. What, which one do you think is going to irritate the bladder? The shot glass. So if you are constantly not drinking enough water, your urine is going to be more, um, concentrated and then that's going to irritate the bladder lining as well. So yeah. And can that, create frequency. Correct. Yeah. So just, just drinking more water. Um, even, even though people it scares people to do that, they're like, no, I can't like, I'm, I'm already having leakage or I'm already having, um, you know, frequency problems. I'm like, okay, well let's increase this slowly. And usually it does help them quite a bit, actually significantly getting them to that where they need to be. That's right for their body. Right. It's not necessarily half their body weight. Sometimes we have to tailor that up and down just depends. Yeah. No, that that's a really good point to slowly improve that. Yeah. I've worked with people before who, like you said, are like barely drinking any water and it's like, oh my gosh, we need to get you to like at least 32 ounces a day. Like that is right. like our bare minimum right. because I used to work with, uh, surgical weight loss patients and they struggled to get their fluid intake because they couldn't drink with their meals. They'd have to stop drinking 30 minutes before their meal. And they could, they had to wait until an, like an hour after their meal to drink. So they had like these small windows, but if they, they couldn't like chug water because their stomachs are like the size of right. smaller than a fist. 
And it's like, so they, they really did struggle. And I feel like that, that has helped me, you know, helping in helping I see patients, because I think for people struggling with getting enough fluid. in, I think it's important to like have water with you at all times, because if it's not there, you're not even going to think to drink it. But if it's, if it's right in front of you, even if you're distracted, you, you can just sip on it. And I think, I think for me having a straw, like a water bottle with a straw is really helpful because you don't have to open it. There's not an extra step. You can just literally sip on it all day. And that can help like instead of chugging or something like that, every few hours, it's like sipping will probably help you not have that frequency. Correct. You're not like over, like you're not flooding your body with a fluid at once. You're Mm -hmm. gradually allowing it to process it. So yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. Small amounts are better than massive chunks. Yeah. But I, you know, I also work with a lot of teachers and nurses and they don't have that option. Like they struggle. Yeah. They don't have the ability to go to the bathroom when they need to. They right. don't have, there's, there's a lot of barriers for that. So there's right. always, there's always exceptions. I'm like, listen, we just got it. You just got to get your fluid intake. So, and honestly, those people should listen to my disability accommodations episode because there might be ways to get accommodations for those types of jobs. And yeah, that'd be great. That, that was one of the earlier episodes. I I can link it in the show notes, but awesome. yeah, I would say those are the most difficult careers to have with IC because yeah, nurses can't have water or food at their nursing stations and they're, they're just working all day. They work so hard. Like you work so hard. Like, it's so stressful as nurses. Yeah. And like, sometimes you're in there with a patient and you have to go to the bathroom, but it doesn't matter. Like you don't have a toy. Like yeah. you just, you can't, you can't. Yeah. So sometimes even like disability accommodations like aren't going to do a thing because if if you're in there with a patient you know and you don't have a choice it just kind of unfortunately I know I know I wish there was a better way for those people to you know just go to the bathroom or or drink more water Mm -hmm. I mean even the stress of those those jobs plays a role as well. So it's like more than one thing is happening in the nursing and and the teaching profession. So it's just like, I I know a lot of people who just had to stop working because they they couldn't do it. They were in so much pain or they, they just had to pee all the time. And it's like, that, that is so sad that, that it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like we really hit some good points here and I think this is a good place to stop. Um, where can people follow you on, um, Instagram and TikTok? And also, are you accepting new patients in, in your practice? Yeah. So, um, my Instagram is barbell with an E on the end, pelvic rehab and TikTok is the same. My Facebook, I've been posting a lot of content on that. And that is my actual my personal account, which is Lauren Carver. And then um, my website is barbellpublicrehab.com. And I currently am accepting new clients. I also do like educational um, wellness visits virtually that um, specifically just offer a lot of education and self-care techniques for people if they, if they Can want Can those that. be done for people out of Georgia? So I can offer education and resources to people out of Georgia, which is just uh, technically my license is in Georgia, but if it's just educational and wellness, I'm not providing a diagnosis or I can give people information. Um, And then for all my Georgia clients, um, I can see you in person. I can also do longer visits if you want to travel to see me. I can treat you for like two hours. Um, so there's, there's options there. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for coming on Lauren. I think that you and I need to do a Instagram live in the future. I think that'd be, yeah, fun. That'd be fun. <laughs> Super fun. I love it. Yeah. Well, everybody stay tuned for that. And yeah, thank you so much for coming on.
Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it.